Hello, Sebastian Lacido here, and welcome to Line Upon Line, where we study a book of the Bible verse by verse. We're going to, in James, we're currently in the book of James, we're going to finish the chapter today, verse 10 through 17. Let me read the verses, and then we'll go back through them individually. It says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil one against one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? Verse 13, come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such a city and spend a year there buying and selling and making profit. Whereas do you not know what will happen to you tomorrow? For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will go live and do this or do that. But now your boasting is and your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. Amen. And so again, the book of, of James, I think it's one of the best books in the New Testament. I mean, it's, a, it's like the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. You know, James, when he writes, uh, you know, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's a pastor. You know, the book is like Proverbs. It's consistently focusing on practical living. It's, you know, it's telling us and encouraging us to act like God's people, to live like God's people. The, you know, the book is filled with direct commandments to pursue life and holiness, and it makes no excuses for those that don't, that don't measure up. You know, James really uh, is, is a book that should be read, I believe, every, um, every month. Uh, it's just, we should read through it and really uh, try and, you know, sort of like reading the book of Proverbs verse, verse by verse. It's, it sort of sets in us a reality, right, of truth and, and keeps our feet to the ground. You know, so let's take uh, verse 10 through 12. It says, humble yourselves. Uh, in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you up. Do not speak evil one of another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law or doer of the word, you're a judge. There is one lawgiver, that's God, who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? You know, so it says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and really walking in humility is a decision. To become humble is a decision. You know, humble yourself. In other words, it's, it's the, the ball's in our court, right? We, can, we make decisions. When we exalt ourself, uh, we come into, we, it really comes from pride, envy, self-ambition, selfishness, self-seeking, you know, which isn't the fruit of the spirit. It's the opposite of the fruit of the spirit. Christians that humble themselves, God will exalt. It says, you know, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. In other sections of scriptures, that it says that God will exalt the humble, you know, and give grace to the humble, but he'll, he'll withstand the prideful. So it goes on and says, do not speak evil of your brother. Do not um, speak evil of your brother. Um, he who speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law or the word of God and the judge. Really, to back up from this, it reflects badly on the Christian faith when believers live like the world and speak against one another, as the world does. Psalm, uh, in your notes, you see Psalm 133, verse 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. When we slander, when a Christian slanders another Christian or someone else, we put ourselves above them. You know, when we judge somebody, we're putting ourselves above them. When we slander them, we're putting ourselves above them. You know, and, and above the word of God and the commandments of God. You know, when you look at what love is, as it's defined in Philippians, it says, you know, that, that, we, that there's two elements to love. One is that we don't exalt ourselves above anyone else. We look eye level to everyone or we, or we look to up to everyone, right? And so we're not to elevate ourselves above anybody. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus washed feet. He prayed for those that despitefully used him, you know, and so he walked in humility and he walked in humbleness. 
you know, and the other thing it says is not look not on the things of another, but, you know, look not look on your own things, but look on things of another. How can I help another? When we act as a judge, a human judge, you know, we're taking God's place. God is the only lawgiver. God is the authority over his creation. In doing this, we're, we're, we assume the prerogative of God in passing judgment on others. We disobey really the greatest commandment to love others uh, you know, as we love ourselves, right? Those are the two things that we're to do. It's God alone. It's God's. Uh, it's it's God's judgment of His creation. You know, the Holy Spirit asks who you are to judge another. I mean, it says it right there. Who do you think you are to judge another? And so, when we look at love, when we look at our walk. You know, Corinthians tells us that we can have faith to move mountains. We can, you know, understand great mysteries. We can give our bodies to be burned. We can, you know, uh, uh, give all of our wealth away. If we don't have love, all of those actions are meaningless. And so James is bringing out here again, you know, if we, we, if we are the sons of God and daughters of God, we should live as sons and daughters of God. Concerning judgment, I have it in your notes in Matthew 7. In uh, verse one, it says, judge not that you not be judged for what with what you judge, you will be judged and with measure you use it, it'll be measured back to you. So the judgment of God comes on those who judge humanity with the same degree or measure that they judge. So when we dare to go above somebody and judge them um, and we look down on them and we judge them that same measure of judgment God is going to send back to us. It's right here in the scripture. Judge not that you not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with me what measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. In fact, he goes on in verse uh, three and says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not consider the plank or beam in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look at a plank in your own eye? Hypocrites, first remove the plank from your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. At least they trample them under feet and, and, and tear them in pieces. So, you know, not only does, does judgment come from God on those that judge with the same measure. But the plank in, another, in, in your eye is, is a bigger sin than whatever you're looking at in your brother's eye. In other words, it's a higher sin. It's a greater sin. They may be wrong. You have to understand they may be wrong. And if they are wrong, it's the word of God that'll change them and it's God that'll change them. Now you can teach, but don't judge. And, and so he's saying it's a bigger sin to judge than it is, you know, what you're worried about in someone else's life. He who's without sin, let him cast the first stone, right? Don't give that which is God's, which is holy, uh, you know, to sinful man. And so we need to understand, you know, James is saying here, listen, you guys, uh, we're one body, we're one group, right? We're all of us are fallible. All of us make mistakes. All of us um, have, you know, dry spells we go through and issues we go through and strongholds we're dealing with. And so, the, you know, the Bible is basically saying that those situations are not for us to judge in someone's life. What we're doing, when you judge, what are you saying? You're guilty of this. Okay. Unless that's done by the Holy Spirit, uh, it's, it's completely wrong. Even though it is wrong, even though they may be wrong, it's not our place to judge them. You know, we have calls of action in our own life. If we know something's wrong in their life, what do we do? We pray. It's the first and primary thing. Pray, Father, I pray that you open their eyes. I pray that they see clearly. I pray that you encounter them. I pray that you bring opportunity for them to see the errors of their way. Secondly, the Holy Spirit may move on you to teach and when the word is, when, the, when, it, when you're humble and not judging, but the word does the correcting, uh, that's the best way to uh, speak into someone else's life. Um, and, and, 
And, and most times, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, a prayer is even more important because God has a way of, of correcting us, right? He corrected me, corrects you. And so, you know, moving on in James 4, verse 13, it says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such a city and, such, and, and spend a year there buying and selling and making profit. Whereas, do you not know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, uh, in such arrogance, and such boasting is evil. You know, these scriptures are about worldly planning. This is something that is really, I think, damning in the church today. I think it's holding lots of people back from true blessing and lots of people back from actually executing God's plan in their life. And that's, you know, uh, the scriptures discuss making worldly plans and being spiritually dull within action. We plan worldly things, we execute worldly things without regard to God. You know, either Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, or he's not. Either we deny ourselves or we don't. Either we pick up our cross, which is given from God, or we don't. Either we follow him or we don't, which means in all of those categories, when we deny ourselves, that means we're, we're putting aside our plans, our purposes for his plans and his purposes. When we pick up our cross, it's, it's the sacrifice in our life that he gave us, similar to Jesus. You know, this is your sacrificial life. This is what I'm giving you to do. And then following means we don't lead, he does. And so as he lays that out, um, you know, in fact, in your notes, I have it in Matthew 16, it says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him, one, deny himself, two, take up his cross, three, follow me. In each one of those things, there's a complete submission to God's will and God's plan in our life. It says for, uh, it goes on to say in verse 25, it says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Let me amplify that out. Whoever desires to save this life will lose the next life. But whoever loses this life for my sake, right, will find it. For what profit is it to a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in his glory of his Father and his angels, and he will reward each one according to his works. We don't give a God a thought or include God or think of God or think of our eternal state when we're making decisions. You know, we should say, what is God's will? What does God want me to do? What will enhance the kingdom of God? Every decision in life should be tied to God, our Lord, our Savior, and our King. The kingdom has to be first. You know, so you say, Sebastian, well, how do I do that? When we surrender to Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he becomes our Lord and Savior, or he doesn't. If he is our Lord, our Savior, our King, our Master, then he's in charge, we aren't. We have now submitted to a King who has supreme authority. He's a benevolent King, a loving King, but we submit to that King to do his will and not our will. So the Bible says that when we come into that relationship, we deny ourselves, which means it's not our decision to go here or spend time there and buy and sell and make profit. You know, it doesn't, it, it's not our decision. You'll see, we'll read a couple of the parables about this matter, but we need to understand that we have surrendered our lives um, and, and our existence uh, because we're eternal. And so we live that life here. We should think eternally, plan eternally, live eternally. We should see eternally, seek the, the, the kingdom of God. We're not judged for sin. We're not going to pay for our sins. Jesus paid for our sins. But we are judged on what we, what we do and how we do it, the attitude, right? Gold, silver, precious stone, or wood, hay, and stubble, right? But we're also judged on our inaction, the things we had opportunity to do, but we didn't do. The missed opportunities. We lose eternal rewards. It's wood, hay, and stubble. You know, the Bible says, you know, what good is your faith if you see someone in need and you don't help, you don't do, you don't, and you have the resources? You know, what good is your faith? What good are your words? What good is the image you want the world to see if you're not actually doing the word? 
And so, um, you know, we've been in this thinking of living in two lives, you know, having one in the world and one in God, you know, living for the world Monday through Friday and going to church on Sunday, it doesn't work that way. It's the same thing with politics today. They want us to take politics and separate it from our Christianity. We, we aren't, we, when we go into a voting booth, we're Christians in the voting booth, out of the voting booth, at work, at home, 24 seven, we can't get away from who we are. So we can't live a life here in the world and we can't live a life for God. It's impossible, we have to make a decision. You know, basically God's saying, if you plan without me, you gain wealth for your balance sheet here and in inheritance, you know, but give no thought to me. What what good is that? You're not, I'm not your Lord and your Savior. You know, I'm not your partner in life. I didn't send my spirit to live inside of you so that you can live your own life continually. You know, here's a parable in, in Luke chapter 12. It says, then he spoke a parable to them. Just before this, he says not to live a life of covetousness. He, then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, this is what he's thinking, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater barns. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, drink, drink and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will these things be which you have provided? So it goes back to James, because what does James say? James says your life is but a vapor and it vanishes away. This life is a vapor. <coughs> so when we look at this, man's thinking and, and his planning and his decisions, you know, here's how he was thinking. I'm doing so great and increasing so rapidly. I can efficiently store all my business activities and my wealth, um, but I can't do it with what I have. I need to get bigger. I need to build bigger barns. I need to increase to a point where I can coast in life. And, you know, he says in their soul, you know, I have many goods laid up for many years. Let me take ease. Well, we never retire. Christians never retire. The Jews never retire. We live for comfort. In this dispensation, people are living for comfort. The Jews in the Old Testament lived to work. And so they, they were, it was imposed on them to have a Sabbath. We, we'd love to have seven Sabbath days. That's the culture in the East, I mean, in the West where we live. And so his thinking is wrong. His thinking, he would, notice what God says. You know, you, your soul's gonna be required of you if you die. And everything you're leaving behind, what good is it in your eternity? You know, you're, he said you're a fool, first of all. Your life could end tomorrow, today, same as James, right? Uh, your goods and your labors and your plans, will you take them with you? What will you take with you? What goes, your heart stops, you're at a you know, funeral home. All of us are going to be there. I'm not trying to be graphic. But the richest man in the world is laying next to the poorest man in the world. Is there any difference? The only difference is where they are, not in their physical body, but where they went. And James is encouraging us to think about that journey, think about that eternity. You know, the rewards there are eternal, not for 100 years here, not for 80 years here, but for eternity, that will be the status of us eternally. We set the status of who we are. If we're in the good seats, if we have lots of wealth in heaven, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He tells us to, that, that, that there's gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Paul says there's crowns waiting for me. And, and so we need to understand, you know, it, we do need funds here. We do, you know, our ministry needs funds. You need funds to live, to pay your bills. But at the same time, we are 24 seven Christians and we live for our Christianity. We are Christians first when we swear our life to Jesus Christ. So, you know, another one here uh, in Luke 14, it says a parable um, in Luke 14 ties. Uh, there's an invitation from God. I, I'm not gonna read the scripture. But, you know, they begin to make excuses. I've married someone. I have an ox. I have a piece of land. I have this. 
making excuses not at the invitation of God, but putting God's creation and God's blessing above God, making excuses and putting a priority. You know, so what do you prioritize? You know, Matthew 6, verse 30 says, So if God clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all of these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. So God knows we need them. The Gentiles are seeking them. But here's what Jesus says to us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of those things will be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. What was the rich man doing? Worrying about tomorrow. What did James say? You know, let, they say in their heart, I'm going to go here and there and buy and sell and make profit without regard to thinking of God, without regard to thinking of the kingdom. You know, Deuteronomy tells us that, that God gives us wealth to establish his kingdom, not just to enrich ourselves. He doesn't care that we have nice homes and we have nice things in our life, but the kingdom has to be first. The sacrifice for the kingdom has to be first. The cross that he gave you and me has to be first. Denying ourselves. You know, when I went into full-time ministry, we, you know, we went through phases in life of great wealth down to nothing. And we're in ministry, me and Chrissy, and we're, there's, you know, there's nothing. We're in a, a place where the strength that I use to gain profit in my life, I'm not. I'm using the strength in my life to teach 16 videos a week. So we're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and we're trusting him that he's going to add all of the other things to us. Amen. You know, so when you look at this section of scripture in James, I think it's so important to understand, you know, uh, when he says, when James says, come now and says today or tomorrow, we will go to such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make profit. Whereas, do you not know tomorrow? You don't know tomorrow, God does. What is your life? It's a vapor. In other words, our life here, let's just say we all get lucky and live to be 100 years old. It's nothing. It's nothing. Everyone in scripture, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Paul, Peter, they're all still alive. They're all in heaven. They all have rewards in heaven. That's our destination. That's why when we experience our, our Savior, when he illuminates in our hearts, our, our entire minds need to change, our entire focus needs to change, to focus on the kingdom, to focus on Jesus, to focus on one another. You know, so that's our message for today. Next week, we'll do uh, chapter five. As I say in every broadcast, we have a phone app. We're being censored horrifically. Um, I showed a... a, a um, a snapshot from late August of last year, so about 15 or 16 months ago, and um, 15 months ago maybe, um, and we had 24,000 views of a five-minute fresh start. We were averaging about eight to 9,000 views. Today, we're averaging about 400. This, this broadcast will only reach about 160 people, and we have three times the followers we did last August. We have 70,000 followers. So 70,000 people hit a button that said, I want to follow that ministry. Not like it, follow it. And so all of our followers should be getting all of our broadcasts, but they're not. We, the way we estimate is about 500 a day, maybe see what we're doing. So that causes us to lose donors. That causes us to lose people that share the message. And, and, and yet we're growing. And that growth comes through sharing the message. So number one, please share the message. Share it with others. Uh, to help connect them with us. But, you know, but we established the phone app. We have a very, very, very well produced phone app. A great vendor did it for us. All of our contents on it, all of our curriculums, our workbooks, are, it can be on your iPad or your, uh, your phone app and the website. But it's easier to listen to a five minute devotion every morning on your phone, right? So you go to the Apple App Store or the Google App Store, type in Watchers the Truth. It'll take you to a page. Look for our little lighthouse. There are some others, Watchers of Truth. Download the app. It's free. You'll have 
everything on it. Make sure you hit yes on the notification. You'll be asked two questions. Yes on the notification, or whether you want light or dark, and it depends on your preference on how you want to see it. Um, and then on that app, uh, no matter if they take us down, you'll always have our content. You'll always be connected to us. The second level to that is you won't be a member of our website. Um, we need your email address and name. So you can do that on our website or you can do it on the phone app. And what that does is it allows us to send you the, the, the notes. Like th these notes, um, I'm, I filmed this on a Wednesday for a Thursday morning launch, but these notes um, you would receive the day before. And so you'd have all the scriptures and all the notes. And the good thing about our notes, we send out three sets a week, is they're a Bible study by themselves. You don't have to watch us live or even our archive teachings if you don't want to. You can just print the four or five pages of notes. The scriptures are there. Uh, the revelation points are there. So they're Bible studies by themselves. That's free. You have access to all of our curriculums. You can ask me to send you 12, 10, 20, two dozen workbooks. It's all free to our members, right? All we need is you pay for shipping. So, and then there's another level, which I'm strongly encouraging you to do. We're going backwards financially. We're losing people because they're not seeing our stuff. And so we need partners. We need capital to grow. Pray and see if the Holy Spirit moves on your heart to give $25 or more um, a month and become a partner with us on our mission. We're being censored because we're teaching truth. I don't compromise I don't change things. I, you know, so a lot of the things that we teach, the world is against. Mark, you know, uh, uh, Facebook is against some of these things. You know, something like this will allow to happen, but instead of 60,000 people seeing it or 50,000 people seeing it, they'll show it to two or 300. Um, and, you know, what, what chance do we have of growing or expanding? So we're meeting with a group next week on what to do and they suspect that we're going to put, um, a, you know, fundraise and put a majority of our money into just moving followers over to our phone app and website, which we do through paid advertising, uh, which Facebook will allow us to do, believe it or not. So, um, you know, we need more capital. We have probably $10,000 in needs right now um, that we need to cover, but, but the idea is, uh, and if you have wealth to write a big check, that's great. But the idea here is to have hundreds, you know, we have several hundred now, but to have three or 400, we, we prayed for 400 new donors this year, partners this year um, at $25 or more, because it's better if it's spread over time, right? And over people. And so $25 is something where you're saying, you know, Sebastian, I'm going to commit six bucks a week to you. Uh, and to your cause, to your mission, to your purpose. Anyway, God bless you. I'll see you next uh, uh, Thursday. We'll have, we'll do chapter five together. God bless and have a great, great day. Thanks for listening.